having more muscle mass is healthy, right? You are stronger. You are more physically able. Muscle mass is incredibly important for glycemic regulation, right? Having more muscle mass can help you have regular blood sugar levels, right? Having more muscle mass is also associated with better cognitive function, better mental acuity. So in essence, to optimize your health, some of the things you should be looking to do with your body is decrease your fat mass if you have excess adiposity and work on building muscle mass through resistance training. What's up, my friends? I want to welcome you guys all to the second episode of the Dr. Joey Munoz Show. I'm really excited for this episode. It's going to be an absolute banger because we're going to be covering a bunch of stuff in today's episode. We're going to be covering the fundamentals of how to lose weight, how to live a healthy life, and how to develop a fit and fantastic looking physique. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. I think a fantastic way to start off this episode is to discuss what being healthy really even means, right? What is healthy? I think we all have a, a somewhat intuitive sense of what it means to be healthy, but let's go ahead and define it. And I think there are several ways to define the word health, right? One is by looking at our blood biomarkers. So if you go to the doctor, you get some blood drawn, they're going to look at some things, right? Some of the things that they look at are like your cardiovascular um, health risks, right? They're going to look at your blood lipids. What does your cholesterol look like? What do your triglycerides look like? They might look at your glycemic control. What does your blood sugar look like? Your insulin concentrations, your hemoglobin A1C. They might look at markers of inflammation, C-reactive protein, TNF-alpha, right? These are all different molecules that we find in our blood that tell us a little bit about our health, essentially. They might look at other markers that are indicative of your risk of developing certain diseases like Alzheimer's, for example, right? So we can go to the doctor, we can get some blood work done, they can tell us some things about our health. However, our health obviously extends beyond just our blood biomarkers, right? You might feel healthy, what does that even mean, right? When you say you want to be healthy, you mean you want to live a long, healthy life. You want to be physically active, right? So do you have uh, healthy and strong bones, right? Because as we age, uh, one of the biggest risks of death is actually breaking a bone, falling, breaking a hip and dying, right? So do you have healthy bones? Are you muscular? Why does muscle matter? Well, muscle allows you to be stronger, be more physically active. Are you flexible? Are you mobile? Do your knees hurt when you walk or when you sit down, right? These are all different indicators of overall health, right? Are you mentally sharp? What is your performance like? Do you feel fatigued? Do you feel energized from day to day, right? And what we want to do with nutrition, with exercise, with our overall lifestyle is be able to optimize those different aspects of our health so that we can live the healthiest life possible, right? So when it comes to health, there are different components that contribute to our health. I mainly want to talk about nutrition and exercise because those are my areas of expertise and those are the things I really care about. And I also lightly want to touch on sleep as well. There are other aspects that influence our health, right? Social relationships, right? Humans are social animals. What are our relationships like with other people? Um, again, there are different aspects or different aspects of our life that influence our overall health. But in this episode, we're mainly going to talk about nutrition and we're mainly going to talk about physical activity as well. Um, and we're going to do so in the context of weight loss and having a healthy body composition and developing muscle mass, right? So let's quickly talk about why do body fat and muscle mass matter, right? Body fat. Why does it matter whether you are fat or not, right? Why, whether you have excess adiposity or not, why does that even matter? Well, as some of you guys probably already know, if you've been watching my content on social media for a while, adiposity or fat is one of the main predictors of your health, of your disease risk, of developing cardiovascular disease, which is the number one killer in the US, of developing diabetes, right? Of dying early, of morbidity. So body fat goes beyond just the way you look physically, right? Having excess amounts of body fat increase your risk, increases your risk of having some of these diseases, right? And what we were talking about earlier, your blood biomarkers, those are in a very large part determined by your body fat. If you have excess body fat, you're going to have elevated triglycerides. You're going to have high cholesterol. You're going to have dysregulated blood sugar, right? All of which contribute to the, those diseases that we were just talking about. So that's why it's important to have a healthy body fat percentage, right? You don't want to have excess adiposity because it contributes to the development of some of these diseases. On the other side, you also don't want to be 
<laughs> without fat because fat has many critical and important physiological roles, right? So it's important to have a healthy body fat percentage. On the other side, we have muscle mass, right? And having muscle mass, more muscle mass, and of course, we're talking within natural limits here. We're not talking about having excessive amounts of muscle mass like you would if you were taking anabolic steroids. But within the context of health, having more muscle mass is healthy, right? You are stronger. You are more physically able. Muscle mass is incredibly important for glycemic regulation, right? Having more muscle mass can help you have regular blood sugar levels, right? Having more muscle mass is also associated with better cognitive function, better mental acuity. So in essence, to optimize your health, some of the things you should be looking to do with your body is decrease your fat mass if you have excess adiposity and work on building muscle mass through resistance training, right? All right, let's go ahead and discuss now how to actually do so. How do you lose body fat? How do you improve muscle mass through nutrition and exercise? And I'm going to be giving you guys some uh, general basic rundowns of the overall science of nutrition and exercise for fat loss and for building muscle. And then we'll talk about some practical recommendations too that you guys can start implementing into your daily life right away. All right, let's go ahead and start by talking about nutrition, right? So nutrition, what is it? It's what you eat, right? There's this concept of energy balance, which is what dictates whether you gain, maintain, or lose body weight, okay? So energy balance is the overarching principle that dictates weight change. So what the hell is energy balance? Well, let's talk about a different term that some of you guys have probably heard of, or probably all of you guys have heard of, and it's calories, right? Calories. I'm sure you guys have heard of the term calories in and calories out, which dictates whether you gain or lose weight. Calories in and calories out is essentially the concept of energy balance, right? So what the hell are calories? Calories are simply a unit of measurement. Now, I know that sounds confusing, but calories are not a tangible thing that you find in food, okay? Like food has protein. Food has carbohydrates. You can actually, those are tangible things. Calories are not a tangible thing. They're a unit of measurement, right? For example, my height. I'm six feet, five inches tall. Six feet, feet are units of measurements, right? Inches are units of measurement. Uh, they're units of measurement for length, right? I weigh 200 pounds. Pounds are a unit of measurement for mass. Calories are just a unit of measurement for energy. There's different units of measurement for energy, but the one we use overall to measure the energy in our food is calories. In some European countries, for example, they use joules or kilojoules. So it's just a unit of measurement, right? And it tells us how much energy we can get from the food that we're eating, right? So we eat food, we get energy from our food, aka calories, and then our body also expends energy, aka burning calories, right? Our body burns calories from just being at rest because we require energy to keep us alive. So our body temperature, regulating our body temperature, that requires calories. Keeping our heart beating, keeping our organs working, speaking right now as I'm doing uh, this podcast, all of those things require energy, aka burning calories. Physical activity, exercise requires energy. Um, even metabolizing, digesting and metabolizing food requires energy, right? So when you eat something, you, you burn some energy actually digesting that food. So weight, your body weight is really the balance between how much energy you consume and how much energy you expend. Why? Because our bodies have the ability to store energy, right? So if we eat more energy, if we eat more calories, then our body actually burns on any day. The excess, the difference, independent of what it's coming from or what food it's coming from, is stored as body fat, right? So let's say you eat 3,000 calories in a day and you only burn 2,500 calories that day. The additional 500 calories are stored as body fat essentially, right? So that's why if you eat too many calories, you gain weight. And on the other hand, right, the opposite of that is true as well. If you eat too few calories, let's say you only eat 2,000 calories and your body burns 3,000 calories, well, your body needs to get those additional 1,000 calories from somewhere, right? So it's going to tap into stored energy sources, aka body fat, to burn that body fat, to use the energy from that body fat so it can fuel the activities that it's going to perform on that day, right? So if you don't eat enough energy from your food, your body's going to get the energy it needs from stored sources, aka body fat, right? So when it comes to weight, 
body weight regulation, right? Gaining weight is really as simple as eating too many calories compared to how many calories your body is burning. And losing weight is as simple as eating less calories than the amount of calories that your body burns, right? If you eat less calories than your body burns, then you lose weight. It's really as simple as that. So why do so many people have issues with weight loss? Well, it's because they can't regulate their eating, right? And there's a number of factors that influence this, right? Hunger, satiety, our environment, right? If you're around people that aren't supportive towards your weight loss goals, if they're always eating stuff that you maybe shouldn't be eating, quote unquote, because you guys know that I don't believe in good and bad foods, and we'll talk about that in another episode, but your environment definitely plays a big role in terms of how much food you eat, right? Your physical activity, if you're not physically active, it's hard to lose weight. Your, your physiology, right? Some people have naturally low energy expenditure if they have issues with their thyroid hormone production, for example. So there's a whole host of reasons why people really struggle with weight loss, but it, it boils down to energy balance, right? If you gain weight, the amount of energy that you are consuming is greater than the amount of energy you're burning. Now, there's a whole host of variables that influence energy intake, and there's a whole host of variables that influence energy expenditure, right? We just talked about some of those variables that influence energy intake. Again, physiology, right? Hormone concentrations are important. Thyroid hormone in particular regulates your metabolic rate, right? Your metabolic rate is just how many calories you burn at rest. There can be issues with hunger regulation, right? Ghrelin, GLP-1, these are all hormones that influence your hunger and your satiety. Leptin, for example, is another one, right? Your environment, your psychology. Your psychology influences your energy intake because if, if you're feeling sad or emotional, some people use food as a coping mechanism. So it is complicated, right? Energy in versus energy out, calories in, calories out is the general concept, but there are many sub-variables that influence each side of that equation. And then energy expenditure. There is a whole host of variables that influence your energy expenditure, right? How much muscle you have, how much you move throughout the day, right? How much you uh, involuntarily move, right? Some people, when they sit down, they're fidgeting all day long. Some people sit still. Those who are fidgeting are burning more energy. Your body size, right? Uh, a large person can inherently eat more and maintain their weight than a smaller person because it requires more energy to move a larger body, right? I'm 220 pounds. If I run for 10 minutes at five miles per hour, I'm going to burn more energy than somebody who weighs 130 pounds and runs 10 minutes at five miles per hour because it requires more energy to move a large body, right? So there's a whole host of variables that influence energy intake and a whole host of variables that influence energy expenditure. So again, the concept of energy balance simply tells us about the relationship between your energy intake and your energy expenditure. Now, the next thing I want to discuss is how we can tailor our nutrition to set yourself up for success, right? If you're overweight and have some excess body fat to lose, what are some dietary changes that you can make to lose body fat and make it feel easier, right? One of the main issues that people experience when they start to diet is that they feel hungry, right? They feel hungry, they have increased cravings because of their hunger, and so they overeat, right? And it's because most people who, who want to lose weight understand that they need to eat less, right? Eat less calories, but eat less doesn't necessarily mean eat less food, right? The thing is most people will take their diet and just eat the same things and eat less of them, right? If you usually have breakfast from Starbucks and you have, I don't know, one of their large uh, frappuccinos or whatever they're called, I never have them. If you have one of their breakfast sandwiches and maybe you have like a dessert, like a brownie or something like that from Starbucks. So that's your breakfast, right? Usual breakfast and you have some fat you wanna lose. Most people will go from having the large frappuccino to a small frappuccino to having half of the sandwich and maybe not having the brownie. So yeah, they're eating less calories, but they're also eating way less food. And when you eat way less food, what happens? You feel really damn hungry and it's harder to actually lose body fat, right? So what we should be doing when attempting to lose weight is not to eat less food, but instead make dietary changes that allow us to reduce our caloric intake while not feeling hungry which is the next thing I want to talk about, right? What are some nutritional strategies to reduce hunger and improve satiety? And satiety is just the opposite of hunger, essentially. That's the way you can think about it. Satiety is how satisfied do you feel after a meal, right? If you have a nice big meal, how satisfied are you? Obviously, the more satiated you are, the higher your satiety, the less hungry you are and vice versa. Okay, so first I want to discuss um, very, very basic concepts. 
In general, for satiety, you want to eat more whole foods, okay? Whole foods, meaning less processed foods. Now, keep in mind, foods, the processing of a food or the the degree to which a food is processed exists on a spectrum. Foods are not processed or unprocessed, right? Anything you do to a food is technically processing. So, for example, if we take an apple, an apple straight off of the tree is the least processed form, right? If you then slice it, apple slices would be a little bit more processed. And then you would have applesauce, for example, and apple juice. And like an apple flavored gummy would be a very ultra processed form of an apple, right? And ideally, the more unprocessed foods you eat, the better you're going to feel in terms of hunger and satiety regulation. Why? Well, there is a couple of reasons here. First off, Less processed foods tend to be higher in protein and fiber. Those nutrients make you feel less hungry on a per calorie basis, right? 100 calories of protein and fiber is going to help you feel fuller than 100 calories of like sugar and dietary fat. On the other hand, ultra processed foods are literally engineered to be really delicious, right? Like if you're eating some freaking Cheetos or um, some Cheez-Its, like they taste fantastic. It's really hard to put them down. It's really, really easy to overeat, right? You can have a full meal and be really full and you can probably still eat some chips. Now, if I just gave you more of your meal, you probably wouldn't want it, right? Like if you had a large meal, it's a, it's a salad, you have some baked potato on there, you have some, some grilled chicken on there. Let's say you eat till you're fully satisfied. You're full, right? If I put some more chicken and some more vegetables on your plate, you probably wouldn't eat it. But if I put something like chips or ice cream or some sort of dessert, which is freaking delicious, you can, you can eat it, right? Because those foods are engineered to taste really good. And how much we eat is not just about whether we feel full or not. It's also about satisfaction. We enjoy eating, right? So stuff that tastes really, really good is very easy to overeat. And in general, if you consume more whole foods, if the majority of the diet is coming from whole foods, it's going to be a lot easier to decrease your overall caloric intake. So dietary patterns, right? Focus more on whole foods. Aside from whole foods, you want to focus on having a relatively high protein diet and a relatively high fiber diet, right? Protein, if you can get like 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight, you're in a good place. For me, I weigh 220 pounds. That's 100 kilograms. One kilogram is 2.2 pounds. I should be eating at least about 160 grams of protein per day. doesn't really matter where the protein comes from. I want to eat at least that much protein. And then when it comes to fiber, if you can get the majority of your fiber from whole and processed foods, right? Beans, legumes, right? Legumes are beans, essentially. Beans fall under the category of legumes. So legumes, whole grains, uh, potatoes are fantastic, vegetables, fruit. If you can get your fiber from those sources and you can consume sufficient fiber, which is about 14 to 16 grams per thousand calories consumed, you're going to be in a really good spot to set yourself up for successful weight loss, right? At least your nutrition will be set up in a really good spot or your nutrition will be in a really good place and it will be geared towards having a healthy body composition. And again, if you have excess body fat, it'll help you lose weight. Why? Because you'll feel full. You won't feel hungry. You're going to be eating a ton of whole nutritious foods and that's going to support weight loss again because of energy balance, right? It's not that whole foods inherently cause weight loss. It's that whole foods help you decrease your energy intake if you eat a ton of processed foods currently. And so they result in lower energy intake, which results in weight loss. If you're eating less energy, then your body expends, right? So that really is the basic fundamentals of nutrition when it comes to having a healthy body composition. Energy balance, aka calories in versus calories out, dictates weight change. Now, when you're trying to lose weight, you don't want to just eat less. You want to make changes in your diet that are going to promote decreased hunger, improve satiety, so that you can reduce your caloric intake, so that you can lose weight. And if you don't have weight to lose, you still want to follow these dietary patterns because they're going to help with your hunger and satiety regulation, which is going to help you maintain a healthy body weight, right? Now, I think it's important to note that you don't have to eat exclusively whole and processed foods at every meal and never, ever, ever eat something like a brownie or a cookie, like delicious processed foods, because I do that all the time, right? It really does come to balance. It comes down to balance and you need to figure out how much of those foods you can include in your diet while still making progress towards your goals, right? If you want to lose fat, 
How much of your diet should be coming from whole and processed foods? How often can you have some processed foods, right? Some people like to have a cookie every day. Some people rather like not have stuff throughout the week and eat more on the weekends. You know, it really comes down to your personal preference and it really comes down to trial and error. For me, for example, I eat pretty healthy most of the day. At night before bed, I love having something sweet. I'll have some ice cream. Maybe once a week, my wife and I will go out for Chinese food. Maybe once a week, I'll have some pizza. But I'm also really physically active, which we're going to talk about physical activity next, right? The more physically active you are, the more you can afford to eat some of these foods because your energy expenditure is higher, right? For me, I know that I can have a, a very well-balanced breakfast. I usually have some scrambled eggs, some fruit, a banana or an apple, and then I'll usually have some additional protein. I might have a scoop of protein powder. I might have some smoked salmon with my breakfast, and that's usually what I have for breakfast, right? Some eggs, a piece of fruit, and an additional uh, source of protein. Sometimes it's Greek yogurt as well. So pretty well-balanced breakfast. For lunch, I'll, I'll usually have some sort of lean beef, right? Ground beef, I might have some fish. I usually have some carbs like potatoes or rice because I just finished working out and I'll have a good amount of vegetables with my lunch too. So I have a pretty well-balanced lunch and breakfast. And then for dinner, I have a little bit more leniency because I like to eat other stuff for dinner, right? I might have pizza uh, maybe two, three times a week. And if I, that's a lie, not two, three times a week, maybe once or twice a week. Um, you know, I eat out maybe two or three times a week and it's meals that are quote unquote, not as healthy, but I still make sure that I don't overeat. But again, these are very calorically dense meals and I have maybe some protein powder as well to make sure I get my protein intake up. If I'm having something like pizza that doesn't have a ton of protein, but again, that works for me, right? That's what I've figured out that works for me doing so or participating in those behaviors alongside with how physically active I am allows me to maintain a healthy body composition that I'm happy with. Right? If I wanted to lose some excess weight, I might tone down the amount of times per week that I go out to eat. I might focus on some more whole foods for dinner and include some of these strategies that we've been talking about that help with hunger and satiety regulation. That being said, it's really up to you and it really does come down to trial and error to see how much you know of your diet uh, or how much leeway you have in your diet with some of these fun foods, right? Because at the end of the day, food is fun. You want to eat. You want to enjoy your diet. You don't want to feel miserable. And the way to do that is to have balance, dietary balance, right? Include some of these foods alongside having an overall healthy dietary pattern. To give you an example, for somebody who's really small and physically inactive, completely sedentary, it's probably going to be really hard to include stuff like cookies and pizza and try to lose weight because their energy expenditure is super low. For somebody, again, like me, weighing over 200 pounds, who has pretty healthy dietary patterns overall, I focus on mainly eating whole foods, vegetables, protein. I can include stuff like pizza and cookies here and there throughout my week, because I'm also really physically active and I won't gain weight, right? So it does come down to your personal situation and your personal preferences. All right, I know there's a ton there. <laughs> you guys probably have your wheel spinning right now. Um, but yeah, this, this whole nutrition thing, that's why there's so much confusion in nutrition, right? Because it's, it's not one answer is going to fit everybody. There are basic principles that you must adhere to if you want to lose weight. But the way you achieve it can look vastly different for two different people, right? All right, so that covers really some of the main principles regarding nutrition that I want to discuss when it comes to losing weight, being healthy, and developing a fit and fantastic looking body, right? Because if you want to be fit, you want to be lean, it's going to require some weight loss. It's going to require you decreasing your caloric intake, being in what's called a calorie deficit, which is where you eat less calories than your body burns. And in order to do so, you probably want to focus on some of the nutritional strategies that I shared with you. Now let's talk about physical activity, exercise. In general, you need to move your body. It's really hard to be lean, and to have a, let's face it, a fantastic looking body if you are sedentary, right? Because again, your energy expenditure is going to be really low and you're also not going to have much muscle mass, right? Most people that talk about being lean, they want to look lean and muscular. They want to look shapely, right? Even women that say like, I don't want to have muscles. You trust me, if you want to have toned legs, for example, if you want to have a toned midsection, it requires you building muscle, right? So you have to be physically active. Now, the good thing is, 
that for general health, you don't have to do any specific kind of physical activity. Now, I'm biased towards resistance training, and we'll talk about that in a second. But what really matters is that you move your body. And an easy way to increase your movement is to enjoy what you're doing, right? So you don't have to do any specific type of exercise. People talk about do this exercise to lose body fat. That's all bullshit, right? There is no specific exercise to target body fat. All exercise does for weight loss is increase your energy expenditure. And again, if your energy expenditure is higher than your energy intake, you lose weight. So what's important is that you move your body and do so in a form that you enjoy, right? Maybe you used to play basketball when you were younger and you start picking up basketball again. Maybe you used to play soccer, right? Maybe you start picking up a sport that you were interested in. I used to play basketball a ton when I was younger and I haven't in the past five or six years just because, I mean, life gets busy, right? We have a kid now, full-time job. I'm working more than 40 hours every week and I still try to get to the gym about uh, 10 hours total for the week. Cause I go five times per week for about two hours. So I just haven't had time to play basketball, but I've really been itching to play basketball again. Right. So I might pick up basketball here or there once a week just to increase my physical activity and have fun with it. So what matters is that you have fun with it, right. And that you are physically active or, or that you, you engage in sufficient physical activity that helps you make progress towards your goal. Okay. Again, there is no set amount of physical activity you should do. You want to be as physically active as you can for your particular lifestyle. And that means setting small goals and increasing them over time. One of the things that I do with all of my clients is I ask them to set a daily step goal. Most people start low if they usually don't track their steps and if they usually don't walk that much. Maybe they start with 4,000, 5,000 steps. One of my favorite things to do is go for a walk, put on my headphones, listen to a podcast, and that way I'm being physically active. I'm learning as well. It's highly educational. So I'm working on developing myself, my personal skills, right? Through listening to podcasts, listening to audiobooks, and I really enjoy it, right? So that might be something you try. Maybe you go for a walk and listen to a podcast. That's a really easy way to increase your physical activity. And maybe you start with four or 5,000 steps. Maybe you bump that up to six or 7,000. Eventually you might be walking 10,000 steps per day. You know, eventually, instead of just walking 10,000 steps per day, maybe you're walking half of those, maybe you're jogging half of those. So it's just setting small incremental goals to increase your physical activity until you get to a point where you feel comfortable with how physically active you're being. The amount of physical activity is helping you with your weight related goals, with your body composition related goals, and it's sustainable, right? Sustainability is important. You should be doing as much physical activity as possible that you can actually sustain long-term. And this is, this is actually a really important topic to talk about. So uh, a family member called me and they wanted to lose weight. And they're like, I'm going to start doing Orange Theory six times a week, twice per day. That's literally what they told me. And they like, don't do any exercise. So I told them like, do you think, or, or I asked them, how long are you going to do that for? And they're like, well, I'm, I'm going to do it till I lose weight or lose as much weight as I want. And I said, and what are you gonna do after? And they're like, well, I'm just gonna stop doing it. And I'm like, well, what do you think is gonna happen? <laughs> you know, obviously the answer is they're gonna wait, gain weight again. And I told them how many times per week could you actually do Orange Theory and like maintain it long-term, right? If it's not six days per week, twice per week, maybe it's just three times a week. But three times a week is a lot more sustainable for their lifestyle than six times a week, twice, twice per day, right? That's pretty much unsustainable for most people. And that's the approach you want to you want to take. It's not as sexy, it's not as exciting, but it's sustainable. And long-term sustainability is what you want to aim for if your goal is to improve your body for the long term. So, pick a physical activity uh, regimen that you like. It doesn't even have to be one type of physical activity. It could be walking. You could play basketball. You could do Orange Theory. Just move your body as much as possible. Have weekly exercise targets. You know, maybe it's walking six thousand steps per day and doing three workouts for the week see how you're responding, see how effective it is. And if you feel like you can slowly increase that amount of physical activity and it's still sustainable, I highly encourage it. Now, I want to talk about resistance training specifically for building muscle because I'm biased. I think everybody, the foundation of everybody's uh, exercise should be resistance training if their goal is to have a lean muscular physique because resistance training is what's going to contribute to you building muscle, right? The purpose, I mean, Exercise will increase your energy expenditure, but the main goal of exercise is to build your physical capacities, right? Cardio is going to improve your cardiovascular endurance, which is going to be beneficial for your cardiovascular health, for your heart. 
lifting weights is going to be beneficial for your muscles and your bones. It's going to help you grow bigger, stronger muscles. And there's a specific way of training for muscle growth, right? You have to lift weights and you have to train hard. I'm going to go ahead and take a little bit of a deep dive here on some basic fundamental principles of training, of resistance training for hypertrophy specifically. Okay. So the first thing I want to address is how often should you train three days per week, four days per week, five days per week? Does it matter? The answer is yes and no. It doesn't really matter directly. What matters is how much total amount of work you do and how many times you train each muscle per week, right? So if you're doing, uh, if you're training your legs, right, you want to train your legs at least twice per week. You want to train your chest at least twice per week. Training muscles at least twice per week is going to be more beneficial than training them once per week, even if you do the same amount of work. I've published YouTube videos on this topic. Um, I've written articles on this, so I'm not going to discuss the specifics of why in this episode, because I would talk about it forever. But in general, training a muscle two times per week is better than once per week. Training it more than two times per week for most people is doesn't give any additional benefit over training just two times per week, right? So if you train uh, three times per week, if you go to the gym three times per week, well, maybe you want to do three full body workouts. That means you would train each muscle three times per week. Maybe you do an upper body workout, a lower body workout, and a full body workout. Again, training each muscle twice per week. If you go to the gym four times per week, maybe you do two upper body workouts and two lower body workouts. Essentially, however many days you go to the gym, you want to structure it so you train each muscle at least two times per, per week. You can go to the gym three, four, five times per week, six times per week. It, it doesn't really matter. For more advanced lifters, the more often you go to the gym, the more total work you can do, right? And if you do more work, you're going to see better results. But for a beginner, going to the gym three times per week, doing three full body sessions is perfect. All right. Next thing I want to discuss is what kind of exercises should you do if you're just starting, right? When you're trying to get the biggest bang for your buck, when it comes to lifting and building muscle, you want to do big compound movements mainly. And then you can do some isolation movements after. What are compound movements? Compound movements are movements that work multiple muscles in the same exercise because they move several joints, right? There, there are several joints moving to contract different muscles that are going to help you complete the exercise. Here's what I mean. When you do a bench press, right? Your elbow is moving and your shoulder is moving. When you do a bicep curl, really only your elbow is moving, right? So single joint movements are what we call isolation movements. Multi-joint movements are what we call compound movements. The reason why we want to focus on multi-joint compound movements is because they train a lot of muscles at once. So you get the biggest bang for your buck, right? A hard set of bench press will train your shoulder, will train your chest, and it will train your triceps, right? You would have to do three different isolation movements to target each of those muscles. So in general, the bulk of your exercises should be big compound movements. Let me share with you guys some of my favorite ones. I like bench pressing, whether it's barbell, dumbbells, machine, doesn't matter. I like doing pull-ups, pull-downs, rows. You could do rows with dumbbells, a barbell, or, or, or a cable, right? These exercises for these compound movements, it doesn't matter if you do them with a cable, with a machine, with dumbbells, with barbells. You want to do these general movement patterns, okay? You want to do a pressing movement overhead, and in the horizontal plane, like a bench press, you want to do a pulling movement overhead, like a pull down or a pull up. And then a horizontal movement, right? A row, a cable row, for example, that's for upper body for lower body. You want to do some sort of squatting movement. It could be a squat. It could be a leg press. It could be a hack squat. It could be a belt squat. It doesn't matter. You want to do some sort of hinging movement like a deadlift. And now aside from those main compound movements, you also want to do some isolation movements to target some other muscle groups as well. Like Hamstring curls are fantastic because those compound movements don't really target your hamstrings as effectively as a hamstring curl. Maybe you want to do a little bit more volume for your arms. You do some bicep curls, you do some tricep extensions, but those, those isolation movements should be accessories to your main movements, which are the big compound movements. All right. Next thing we want to address is how many sets should you do for each of these movements in general, for each muscle group, you want to do at least 10 sets per week. So 10 sets for your chest, 10 sets for your back, 10 sets for your legs, at least. The more, the better, but you want to do at least 10 in order to make progress, right? And that just means, um, that just means doing 10 total sets for the week. At least you don't have to do them all in one session. Again, if you're training your chest two times per week, that means you do five one day and five the next day, but at least 10 sets per muscle group is going to be effective for building muscle. 
Next, let's discuss rest periods. I think this is a really important topic to discuss because a lot of people uh, will go to the gym, rest 30 seconds, rest 60 seconds between sets, and they're, they're going for the next set. That's fine if you're just exercising for the purpose of exercising. If you're training to build muscle, you want to rest at least two to three minutes between sets for like isolation-based movements or, or machines. And if you're doing heavy compound movements like a squat or a bench press, resting three to five minutes is ideal. Because what matters for muscle growth is your performance on each set, not how much your muscles burn, not how much you're sweating, not how hard you're breathing, right? So resting sufficiently between sets is going to allow you to recover properly and push yourself really hard on each set. Your performance will be better on three sets of bench press if you rest three to five minutes compared to doing three sets of bench press only resting one minute, right? Let's say you have 100 pounds on the bench. If you do your first set, you get 10 reps, you rest 60 minutes or not 60 minutes, that's a long time, rest 60 seconds, you might only get five reps your next set, rest another 60 seconds, maybe you get three or four reps. On the other hand, if you rest three to five minutes, you might get 10 reps, nine reps, eight reps. So your overall work is a lot better if your overall work and your overall performance is a lot better if you rest sufficiently between sets. Next, let's talk about intensity. Intensity just means how hard you train. And this one it's fun to talk about because most people that go to the gym that want to build muscle do one of two things. They train too easy. You see them finish their set and it still looks like they're warming up or they go balls to the wall as hard as they can go. And like, they look like they're dying. They need their spotter to come up and pull the chest off of their the bench off of their chest. And so they, they're just training way, way, way too hard for the majority of your training. You don't need to ever go to failure, but you do need to train hard. And if we look at the research, if you stop one, two, or even three reps shy of failure, you're still going to get a really, really good stimulus for growth. For example, let's say I can bench 225, which is two plates for 10 reps. So if I go absolutely as hard as I can, if I go to failure, I can get no more than 10 reps. Well, for most of my sets, if I just do anywhere between seven and nine reps, it's going to be pretty effective for muscle growth. And when you leave a couple of reps left in the tank like that, you're still training really hard, but you're not really fatiguing yourself nearly as much so you can recover better and you can handle more total work as well. So for most of your training, you should be leaving one, two, or even three reps left in the tank at the end of your set. Now there definitely are times to push yourself harder and go to failure, but I'm not gonna discuss that in this episode. I'll definitely make a more nuanced episode in the future, specifically talking about these topics related to hypertrophy training, okay? And the last thing I really want to discuss is range of motion, which again is something people don't focus on. There's really good research showing that if you want to grow muscle optimally, you need to lengthen it. Okay. So for example, your quads are maximally lengthened at the bottom of a squat. Squatting ass to grass is the best way to grow your legs because you're lengthening, AKA stretching your quads and your glutes at the bottom of the squat. If you don't fully stretch the muscle, even if you're reaching failure, even if you're training really hard, it's not going to be optimal for muscle growth, right? If you're bench pressing and the bar isn't touching your chest every rep, then you're not maximally stretching your chest and you're not getting the best stimulus for growth from the bench press, right? So always try to maximize range of motion as much as possible and make sure that you're focusing on range of motion before you try adding weight to the bar or getting another repetition. Never sacrifice range of motion for more reps. It's, it's really just not worth it. The last thing I want to talk about is the fact that building muscle takes a long ass time, right? You need to do all these things correctly and you need to do them for years, right? And this is where people like, they don't want to hear this. They want to hear that they're going to build muscle in three to six months and you will build some muscle in three to six months. And in a year from now, you'll look a lot better than you do now. But if you want to build substantial muscle, if you really want to change your body altogether, you're going to have to be training the rest of your life, right? So you, it's important that you enjoy this stuff. For example, I've been training for 13 years consistently now. Um, genetics do play a huge role in how much muscle you can build. Everybody can build muscle, but genetics determines how much muscle you can build and how quickly you progress, given that you're training optimally, right? But in general, to really transform your body, you're going to have to be training for at least three to five years. I'm pausing because I want you to let that sink in. You have to train for at least three to five years. If you're not willing to do that, you're not really ever going to see very drastic changes in your body, unfortunately. If you want short shortcuts, quick answers, like uh, quick progress, it's just not going to happen. And you're just going to continue spinning your wheels over and over again like you probably have for the past couple of years. So the quicker and the faster you accept this fact and you're okay with it and you're willing 
to put in the work and train for the next couple of years, really train for the rest of your life and focus on your nutrition and focus on making these small dietary uh, changes and focusing on making healthy habits until you actually take the steps to do those things you're not going to see very drastic changes in your body, right? And you need to start doing those things today and you need to start doing them consistently and improve on them over time. And three to five years down the road, you'll be happy. You'll be really, really happy you did so. I promise, okay? Anyways, last thing I want to discuss here when it comes to losing body fat, having a healthy body composition, being fit, looking fantastic is sleep. And I'm not going to take too long to discuss sleep, but I think it's one of the... Um, under discussed topics when it comes to body composition. Sleep affects your hunger and your satiety. There's really good research showing that people who are sleep deprived or shift workers who don't sleep at night and sleep throughout the day tend to have um, increased hunger, poor satiety regulation, and they tend to eat more, right? So for that reason, sleep is also associated with weight gain. Sleep also affects your energy expenditure. People who sleep less have lower energy expenditure. They burn less calories through the, throughout the day, possibly because they're tired and they move less. And if you move less, you burn less energy, right? Aside from that, aside from its effects on energy regulation, hunger, satiety, food intake, sleep also affects how well you respond and recover from resistance training. So if you're trying to build muscle, it's imperative that you prioritize your sleep, right? I want to share with you guys a couple of quick tips that might help improve your sleep hygiene. Keep in mind, I'm not a sleep expert, but these are things that everybody should include to, to improve their sleep hygiene and improve their overall sleep quality, right? Ideally, you're not looking at artificial lights an hour or two before bed, not looking at your phone, uh, not watching TV, because those things keep you awake, right? If you're watching your favorite show, you're not gonna go to sleep, you're gonna watch the whole episode, and they probably hook you at the end and you probably want to watch the next episode. And next thing you know, it's two in the morning, three in the morning, and you need to wake up at eight and you've only gotten four or five hours of sleep. So limiting artificial lights before bed is going to be extremely helpful. Two, make sure you have a cool and dark room. Again, no lights. So you, you want your room to be dark. And two, make sure it's cold, ideally below 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Our bodies need to cool down to actually fall asleep. And you can do so just by having a cool room, right? So make sure the temperature is appropriate. Maybe you buy a mattress pad, a, a, one of those cooling mattress pads, but you want to have a cool environment to be able to fall asleep quicker. Three, this is something I share with a lot of my clients. Maybe have some sort of ritual or habit before sleeping that you perform some sort of relaxing activity that helps you relax, de-stress, calm down, that puts you in an overall calming mood that promotes sleepiness, right? Maybe it's reading a book. Maybe it's stretching. Maybe it's taking a warm bath. All of these things, again, it's just something that you enjoy, right? For me, I really like just chilling in bed, having a nice, cool, dark room, and I can fall asleep pretty easy. For some people, taking a warm bath, stretching for five to 10 minutes helps them feel really relaxed, and it's going to help with sleep. But having some sort of relaxing activity, some sort of relaxing ritual before sleep is going to be incredibly helpful. And lastly, for people who are really sensitive, myself included, you might want to look into having an eye mask, right? Let's say you're married, you have kids, you share a room with your partner and your kids. Um, they like watching TV later than you do. They don't want to compromise on it and it becomes an issue. Well, maybe you just buy an eye mask, right? You cover your eyes. It's nice and dark. You can fall asleep. For me, I'm really sensitive to sounds, right? If my wife snores a little bit, if our baby snores, I cannot sleep. So I wear earplugs sometimes to sleep, right? It may sound silly, but I prioritize my sleep because I know how important it is for my overall health. So those are some simple strategies that you guys can include in your overall like sleep ritual, essentially, right? Or pre-sleep habits to help improve your overall sleep quality and your sleep duration. Ideally, you want to sleep at least eight hours a night. I know you guys have all heard that. For some people, it's unrealistic given their schedules, but we can all do some things to improve our overall sleep quality. All right, guys, let's go ahead and wrap it up. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode so far. A bunch of practical tips related to nutrition, energy balance, and food choices for hunger and satiety regulation. Again, if you're looking to lose weight, improve your body composition, you want to make sure that you're eating mainly whole foods, focusing on protein, focusing on fiber, while still having some flexibility and enjoying some of the foods you like, some fun foods as I like to call them, brownies, cookies, ice cream, whatever it may be. And the amount of those foods that you consume really comes down to balance and your personal goals and your level of physical activity. And it just takes trial and error to find where that is, right? It takes work. It takes work. It takes effort, 
But the more you play with your nutrition, the easier and more in tune you'll be with your overall diet and with your overall body composition too. And then aside from nutrition, it's, fo- it's important to focus on physical activity, right? Physical activity, move your body. It's that simple. doesn't matter what you're doing. Move your body. Have a daily or a weekly step goal and then have, uh, have a plan or set goals on how much physical activity you're going to do on a weekly basis. Again, maybe you start with a goal of 5,000 steps and you're going to play basketball for an hour twice a week. And then slowly you increase that. Maybe six months, a year down the road, you're walking 10,000 steps per day, you're playing basketball three times per week, and you're lifting weights three or four times per week, right? That, that's a radical change. That will radically help you improve your physique. But you need to start slow. Start slow and slowly increase it. And then if, you're, if you really are focused on wanting to improve your body composition by maximizing how much muscle your body has and, and really improving overall muscularity, you want to train specifically with resistance training in a way that's conducive and optimal for building muscle. I shared some tips earlier, but I'm definitely going to be making a future episode specifically on hypertrophy training, hypertrophy, AKA muscle growth. Okay. And lastly, prioritize your sleep. All righty guys, I've been talking for a minute. I hope you guys really enjoyed this episode. If you guys did enjoy the episode, keep in mind, I do these episodes completely for free. I would really appreciate if you left a five-star rating for me or subscribe to my channel on YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube and leave a comment below. Also, if you guys want to support me, I'm going to leave a link below to PayPal. Again, these episodes take a ton of work to script, brainstorm, record, edit. It actually costs money for me to make these episodes and I don't make anything from it. So if you want to see this podcast flourish, if you want to support me, consider donating. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you for tuning in and I'll catch you in the next episode. Peace.